Hi everyone, welcome to Reading 52. This is uh, a reading on fixed income securities. You'll find that we are in the first study session that contains a lot of the basic concepts with regards to fixed income. And you can see here that we're looking at the defining elements. So if you've never really come across bonds before, then obviously this reading is for you. It will give you a good kind of overview of some of the basic features of bonds that will then develop as we move into later readings. So you can see here, first of all, one of the first learning outcome statements there is describe the basic features of a fixed income security. So, for example, the maturity, the coupon, we'll talk about those concepts. Uh, then identify the terms and conditions of the bond, known as the indenture. And then we move into how we can construct covenants within the indenture that could be affirmative or negative. We then talk about some of the legal and regulatory restrictions, including some of the tax considerations that you should take into account when looking to invest into bonds, and then also deciding how the coupon, which is the cash flow structure of a fixed income security, along with its principle, which is the repayment of the maturity of the bond, um, are structured, because there are different types of bond in existence, and we'll talk through some of those. The last bit in there is describe some of the contingency provisions that might be contained within a bond. So we'll talk about the um, concept of callable bonds, puttable bonds, convertible bonds, and the concepts of warrants to finish off. <clears throat> so the first concept we've got is the basic features of a bond. So the first part there is with regard to the issuer. So you've got to remember that um, there would be a bond holder. That's the person that decides to buy this financial instrument known as a bond. In return, they will be giving cash to what we call the issuer. That's the entity that's issuing the bond in order to raise capital for many different purposes. Now, in this case, we're just identifying that the types of issuer might be a supranational organisation, such as the World Bank, who need to raise finance. It could be sovereign national governments, so for example, the US Treasury, in order to cover the um, government spending that they carry out, they may have to issue bonds to cover that spending. You've got non-sovereign or local governments, so acting within the jurisdiction of the US, there are kind of, if you like, sub-governments. So for example, the state of California have the ability to raise capital by issuing their own bonds. We've got quasi-government entities, so probably a well-known one would be the Federal National Mortgage Association, also known as Fannie Mae. And those guys, what they're doing is issuing bonds in order to finance the purchase of mortgages from financial institutions. So opening up the secondary market of the mortgage market, people like Fannie Mae will be buying up those mortgages. In order to do that, they need capital. And what they can do is issue bonds to then raise that finance in order to purchase mortgages. And that helps to free up the balance sheet of um, financial institutions, which will then aid the lending process where they don't have the mortgages stuck on their balance sheet. So we'll find in later readings, we'll talk about this concept of securitization in a little bit more depth. We also have, obviously, companies. They're corporate issuers. In order to finance projects, they might issue a bond to the market. In return, they're going to receive cash, and that allows them to go and invest into that project. So several different types of issuer. Now, there'll be the case that um, if you're the bondholder, you're going to pay cash. We'll see in the valuation chapter, that's going to be linked to the present value of all of the future cash flows that the bondholder is going to get. And the bondholder is going to probably find that the bond comes with a maturity. That's going to represent the date upon which the um, issuer is obligated to redeem the bond by paying back what we call the outstanding principal. This is the amount that the investor, sorry, the issuer, promised to pay back on the maturity of the bond, which you can see here. Also known as, again, lots of different terms here, so be aware of them. You've got their face value, nominal value, and the redemption value. So for example, the par value is what's being paid back on the maturity. And bonds can have any par value. It could be $100, could be £100, could be $1,000. Okay, this will all be specified within what we call the indenture, which is the terms and conditions we'll see later on. Often the bond price, which is linked to the par value, will be expressed as a percentage of par value. So for example, if you had a thousand as the par value or nominal value, 
and it was selling for 97, that would be interpreted as 97% of 1,000, so a price of 970. Now, given that the um, bond price is below 1,000, we would use the term discount to express that bond. So a bond that is priced below par value is known as a discount. Bond price above par would be known as a bond trading at a premium. And again, we'll see in the valuation chapters some of the implications as to when bonds will trade at a discount, when they will trade at a, um, a premium. So we just mentioned just a second ago the maturity represents the date upon which the issuer is obligated to redeem the bond. That's be done by paying the outstanding principal or the nominal value. When the bond's issued, it will obviously have a lifespan. So upon issuance, that lifespan could be less than one year. It could be more than one year. So we do coin the terms money market instruments as bonds being issued with a maturity of one year or less. Capital market instruments would be bonds that when issued have a maturity of greater than one year. So for example, you have treasury bonds issued by the US government, greater than one year. You have US treasury bills or T-bills, which are issued with a lifespan of less than one year. And again, we'll find out in later readings some of the implications of the features of these money market instruments versus capital market instruments that have a lifespan of greater than one year. Perpetual bond are bonds with no stated maturity date. So in the UK, we have... Um, a UK bond, okay, issued by the UK government, known as a gilt, and there is a particular issue known as a war loan. That's a bond that's going to pay a fixed coupon into perpetuity where there's no set redemption date by the bond. It could be that the company decides to redeem it, that will be upon notice to the bondholders, but upon purchasing that bond, you understand that there's no set date to redemption specified. <clears throat> Next bit we've mentioned is the idea of a coupon. So if you were the investor, the bond holder, we said that you would pay a cash amount to the issuer. In return, they would provide you with a bond. That will give you the nominal value back on maturity, but also over the life of the bond, you will receive a coupon rate in most cases. There are some bonds that don't. We'll talk about those later on. But the coupon rate represents an interest rate that the issuer agrees to pay each year until the maturity of the bond. This is often expressed as, uh, well, it will be expressed as a annual percentage of par value. This is known as the coupon rate. So an annual percentage of par value. So for example, we had a 3% coupon on a bond of 100 of par value. Then that will pay in total for the year 3% of 100 pounds. However, the frequency of that coupon payment could vary. It could be annual, it could be two installments of £1.50, could even be done on a monthly basis. So in that case, we've got to appreciate is the coupon rate is always an annual rate, but the frequency of that coupon payment could be on a non-annual basis. So for example, semi or monthly. Um, if we have a fixed coupon, so 3% every year until maturity, we use the term a plain vanilla or a conventional bond to express the point that it's got a fixed coupon. We'll see later on that some of the coupon structures can vary. There are what we call FRNs or floating rate notes, and they are coupons in which they float through time, i.e. they go up and down. So that's going to be possibly uh, where the coupon is linked to a floating rate such as LIBOR. This is the London Interbank Offered Rate which represents an average lending rate between banks. It goes up and down on a daily basis, such that your coupon payment references the LIBOR on a particular date. That can go up and down, and therefore you'll find that your coupon payment goes up and down. Now, LIBOR represents an average lending rate between banks, which might have a credit rating, so to determine the level of credit risk these companies have of, let's say, roughly AA. In that case, if an issuer is issuing a bond, they're likely to have a maybe worse credit rating than these banks, in which case they couldn't just pay LIBOR as a coupon, which goes up and down. They may have to attach what we call a spread. Okay, this is often um, expressed in what we call basis points. So LIBOR might be 3%, and we might add to that a constant spread of 20 basis points. One basis point is 100th of percent. Therefore, 20 basis points would be 0.2%. So we're promising to pay LIBOR 
plus 0.2% as a coupon periodically on the bond. And that spread's gonna reflect possibly the credit risk of the company when the bond was issued to try and attract investors to invest into that company by lending them money. Zero coupon bonds do not pay a coupon, so 0% coupon rate, in which case you're gonna buy that bond at a discount when we said that's below par value, redeem it at par value on the maturity date and therefore make the difference between the, the price you pay, which is a discount, and the nominal value of the bond. Currency denominations can be variable. You know, there's lots of different um, types of currency denomination for bonds out there. Borrowers in developing countries may choose to issue bonds in US dollars. Okay, so you know, quite a, a currency with, with kind of value. It's very uh, well known that people will often try to buy bonds denominated in dollars. Okay, it's a currency in which people know, and therefore a company may find it easier to issue in dollars than it would be to issue in their local currency, which is not as popular. Dual currency bonds will make coupon payments in one currency and principal repayment in another. So it could be the case that a company is trying to finance a project overseas. Um, they may be able to service the um, borrowing by paying maybe the coupon in their kind of local currency because they will have cash flows being generated by their companies that they can actually service the interest payments with their local currency. But this might be trying to finance a project overseas in a different currency that when they actually get the project going, that when they get to the maturity date, they can use the proceeds from that foreign currency to pay off the principal at the end of the life of the bond. So the coupon could be in a currency which is domestic, but the principal might be in a foreign currency that they'll pay off at the end. Again, sometimes giving the company a little bit of flexibility to service the bond, maybe in a currency of their choosing, but actually pay off the principal in a different currency. Um, currency option bond is giving the bond holder this time the, the, the kind of choice um, in which to receive the coupon and the principal payment. So it could be again giving a little bit of flexibility to the bond holder to potentially choose the currency in which they wish to receive the coupon, therefore potentially giving them more enticement to enter into the bond in the first place.